and welcome everybody. And um, I'm going to um, just take a moment, just very quickly, to introduce Todd Paglia. He is our Executive Director of Stand Out Earth, and he will be introducing Reverend Angel. Thanks, thanks Anne. <clears throat> so it's my pleasure uh, to introduce Reverend Angel, who has been a friend and teacher for dozen plus years. And we're really pleased that she's back with us to talk about radical Dharma. Uh, Reverend Angel is a spiritual teacher, master trainer, and the founder of the Center for Transformative Change. She's a thought leader that has been designing practices, workshops, and retreats to empower activists to be more values aligned and effective in their work to change the world for over 15 years. She's also a writer, um, wrote the very well-regarded being Black, Zen in the Art of Living with Fear, Listness and Grace, and she's the lead author of a book published a year ago, Radical Dharma, Talking Race, Love, and Liberation. Uh, Reverend Angel is also a member of the Stand.Earth Board of Directors. She is the Chair of Mindfulness, Equity, and Culture, uh, and it's great to have her with us. Uh, thank you so much for, for coming on a webcast again, Angel, and talking about your work. Um, I have a bunch of questions I'm dying to ask you, but I wanted to give you the mic for a minute to, to set the tone. Where yeah. are we at? Oh, okay. Let's, we are here. Uh, Radical Dharma is uh, in its, uh, having its birthday right now. And uh, for those of you that don't know, Radical Dharma, Talking Race, Love, and Liberation was published uh, right around Juneteenth of last year. It was specifically published at that time because Juneteenth is, or June 19th uh, is the day that uh, slaves were freed and the final word got to the last slaves in Texas. And so it is considered a week of freedom, a, leave, a week of celebrating freedom and possibility and everything going forth. And as many of you know, it was also the week of the solstice, which is also a time to celebrate what is new and what is emerging. Uh, I know that a lot of us have had just a rough time, uh, you know, since, since November, really trying to figure out what to do. And if you have uh, seen any of the work that I've done and the articles that I've written in the last uh, six months, I've talked about the fact that I think that this is really an opportunity. And uh, one of the things that a lot of people don't know is that when Wat Radical Dharma was written, it, this is really auspicious, Todd, we, um, we really jammed for the book to be released when it was. And it, I mean, I, I was literally writing the book in February of 2016 is when I put the digital pen down, so to speak. Uh, if you look inside of Radical Dharma in the introduction, you'll see that it's signed off on in February uh, 20, February 20th, on 2016. And I was in Istanbul, Turkey at the time. And the world has changed, uh, let's say radically uh, since then in many ways, at least it appears that on the surface. But what I've been saying and what I knew and my co-authors knew is that this was just pre that, 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 this, that this is was headed, that we were headed for a time in which we need, need to have these, uh, the kinds of conversations that gets beneath the beneath the beneath, right? Like underneath the, the real, like what is happening in America, what is happening in the world. And frankly, we have avoided it for far too long. And so we really pushed for Radical Dharma to be published in advance of the elections. And good thing we did because it would have been swallowed up by what, uh, what happened in the elections. But the great thing about that is that it primed Radical Dharma uh, to be available for people at a time when people really needed to turn to something and start to understand uh, and, and one of the things that people have often said to me, actually, is to put words to things that they have been feeling that they hadn't actually been able to put words to. So it's been um, a sort of a strangely exciting year in many ways uh, for Radical Dharma, because in some ways you, you do a book like this and you don't really want it to become more popular in the sense that it, there's more need for it. But that has been the truth. I'm glad that Radical Dharma is out there. I know my co-authors, uh, uh, Lama Rod and Dr. Yasmin Saidula, are also uh, really, really happy to have been able to make this contribution. And at this point, we, we know that Radical Dharma just has a lot more rounds to do, a lot more work to do. One of the things that we've said is that uh, it's kind of right at its beginning. 
So it's not really that the book has been out and now it's like done for. It's, it's truly at its beginning. It's kind of like getting when water gets on parched earth. At first, there's just a kind of runoff. And so Radical Dharma has been wetting the soil, so to speak, of the conversation on race and oppression and getting itself prepared, getting people prepared to go to the next level. And so that's what we're looking forward to. I really thank Stan, which I love and have been with for a long time for hosting this conversation and making it available to the kind of people that I know want to be deeply in this conversation. And so let's uh, like wet up the soil now that we're, we've, we've got it, the parched earth a little bit uh, moist. Let's start wetting the soil and, and digging deep so that we can uh, get on this path to liberation that I hope that Radical Dharma is gonna be a part of for everybody's lives. Great, thank you, Angel. And there's over almost 300 people joined us for this conversation. So there's a lot of desire out there to talk about this stuff. We're gonna to get to the audience's questions uh, in just a little bit. But I wanted to get a sense, Angel, on um, Radical Dharma. First of all, tell us where we can get the book. If you haven't read it, you have to read it. Um, second of all, um, Angel, you've always been an activist, maybe even more than a writer. So. Where has Radical Dharma shown up as far as in the real world, um, where you're organizing and working with people on this intersection of uh, mindfulness and activism and, and, you know, and it's changing and evolving and the need is greater than uh, you even probably imagined. So how are you handling that? What's, what's happening? Are there workshops? Like, how do we get engaged in this after we read the book? Yeah. Uh, so I have a big imagination. <laughs> and I, I imagined that uh, radical dharma was absolutely going to be needed and that it'd be mm. needed for years to come. What I didn't anticipate is the rate at which 45 would become uh, the best thing so-called for radical dharma business. And mm. uh, that has been the case. If people have found themselves just like looking over the precipice of where is our country going? What is this about? What is this revealing for us? And how do I locate myself in this conversation in a way where I'm not just a bystander, where I'm actually being able to deeply engage the kinds of things that have brought us to this moment? And uh, really, we have like a 50 year, we have a 400 year truly uh, running history that has brought us to this moment. And as I uh, introduced in uh, just after the elections that we're, we're, where we're at is really a reckoning. We're at a place in which we are trying to reckon with like what this country has really been about always and what its potential is for us to go forward in the future. But we simply can't do that if we don't get down to the truth. And that is what Radical Dharma has been about. It's been about setting the, the uh, conditions, if you will, for people to begin to have the kinds of hard conversations that we all know that many of us on the progressive left, especially uh, good, well-intentioned white folks have been able to avoid in terms of like the deeper conversation. We're at that place where we're recognizing, you know, that uh, racism and oppression and, um, you know, ordinary everyday racism is not about people in white sheets. It's not about the alt-right. It's not about, <laughs> Excuse me. It's not about the people uh, that do that are like 45 that say brash things, that say rough things, that say horrible things. I mean, we got to keep our eye on the prize on that. But where we really need to bring our attention is the place in which racism lives in our hearts, in our daily lives, in the uh, so-called microaggressions. <coughs> Excuse me, and. Radical Dharma was clearly not written for the alt-right. It's not written for the Trumpians. It's not written for the people that uh, don't believe in love and justice as the place in which they stand and live on behalf of all. Uh, Radical Dharma is, is written for people like, like yourself, Todd, like Anne, like uh, the staff at, uh, at uh, stand.earth, environmentalists, progressive uh, left activists, the people that know that the world needs to be a place that thrives for people of different religions, different races, different sexual orientations, transgender folks. It's for the Philando Castiles uh, to be able to uh, 
have a place in which the voice in, that has not been heard that has allowed for their death to take place to, to be heard and where that place has to happen is in our hearts and it has to happen in the kinds of conversations. We can have all the advocacy we want, but if we don't change hearts and minds, we are going to continue to see this country uh, be wrestled over because you have a body of people who rightfully, I want to say this really clearly, that a body of, there is a body of people that rightfully believe that this country was made for them. It was designed for them. It was did not designed for the majority of us that are out there in the streets now that are trying to make a space for ourselves and make a space for equality and inclusion and diversity for ourselves despite the intentions of the founding fathers that while they were writing all men created equal they were not considering women they were not considering black folks they were not considering the indigenous peoples whose lands they were taking they were not considering the mexicans whose border they were crossing over and i think that we have to get down to the bottom of this kind of this kind of conversation where we get out of the denial that america was somehow designed or constructed or built for all of us and start to think about the new America. But we have to think about that new America from the place in our own lives in which we are in our radical truth and we consider the things that we had to give up in order to belong, the ways in which we became complicit in race and uh, oppression in all of its forms, the way we as men, uh, well, not we as men, but <laughs> y'all as men have been com complicit with patriarchy, the way uh, white folks have been complicit with racism on a day-to-day -day basis. And I, uh, when I say that, I'm not talking about some folks, you know, mean, terrible folks off in the corner, but just people living their daily lives. And the way we have to do that is we have to get woke and we have to stay woke in order to figure out how it is that we are playing a part every day. People of color have to figure out their internalized oppression and kind of have the hard conversations in not only which we confront white folks around us, but which we confront ourselves and we figure out the ways that we have been internally colonized in our minds that have allowed us to be, in some cases, the best gate gatekeepers of, white, of, of patriarchy and white supremacy uh, that the country has ever produced. Mm -hmm. So that's what Radical Dharma is about. And in the last year, I've been, a lot of people don't know that in addition to writing and teaching as a spiritual teacher, I also lead and co-facilitate a race training called EMBRACE, which stands for Embodied Race and Power. And what we do is we go into communities, yoga communities, spiritual communities, Buddhist communities, and organizations that are interested in going deeply and looking at where race lives in our bodies and how do we do the practices and do the deep work and have the deep conversations that get us out of that. But there is one caveat and it is that the only way that I personally do race trainings is when the uh, communities themselves are committed to or willing to engage mindfulness and contemplative practices and embodied practices as a way of ch facing race. And can you talk more about that specifically, Angel? This is something that came up in one of the trainings you did for Stand.Earth just recently. Mm -hmm. And um, just talk to us a little bit about that as far as like why, you know, this connection, which is not necessarily intuitive for some people between mm -hmm. mindfulness and equity and race. Like what, what, how does that connect for you? I know how it connects for that Stand.Earth. Um, but how do, how do you see it? I was struck that you only work with groups on these issues if they have a mindfulness practice. And that, that's fascinating. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, you know, there are amazing uh, organizations that do race uh, trainings. Uh, People's Institute for, for Survival and Beyond is one of them uh, out of New Orleans. And of course there's Race Forward and the trainings they do. There's uh, their organization Center for, Environment, for, for Diversity and the Environment that do specific trainings uh, for uh, you know, particular sectors. But I am convinced that if we are not doing trainings in a way in which we are ex examining our own, uh, where we stand, literally, right, in terms of our own participation, if we're not doing the internal work, 
then I don't think that we are, have any choice but to end up in a location in which we are still othering people. So in other words, if we don't have skin in the game and if we're not able to do the hard work of in examining where we are internally, that n doesn't come just out of like a Buddhist perspective. And uh, one of the things that we've seen is that many uh, other religious uh, organizations and spiritually based organizations, particularly yoga, Christian organizations, even evangelical groups are taking up radical Dharma because Dharma is not about Buddhism. Dharma is about truth. And so you can't get to your truth if you're not willing to do the work and you don't have the kinds of practices that are necessary to be able to sit with what is uncomfortable. And uh, truly that is where our country is at. That is what we're uh, navigating. We are navigating, as I often say, a, we're having an identity crisis. We're having a spiritual crisis in this country. We're trying to solve it with political means. And by making the choice to work with organizations and communities that, uh, and institutions that are willing to take an embodied and mindful approach to looking at race, what that assures for me is that those folks have skin in the game, that uh, white folks have skin in the game, that they're not running around talking about how can I fix uh, you know, race and deal with oppression because I wanna fix it for my black friends or my Latino <clears throat> friends or for immigrants, but I wanna fix it for myself because I know that that slavery, the history of slavery in this country, that the history of oppression, that patriarchy has, uh, as, as, as Malcolm X said, has uh, bamboozled all of us and that we have skin in the game and that we want to get out of it because what we are left with when we don't examine the way in which racialization and, and oppression have lived with us, we don't get to see the ways we have cut ourselves off of off from love and relationship in our within our organization and institutions. We're going to keep having these white run organizations that are trying to scratch their head and say, hey, what do we do about this? When they can't see what do I do about this? What is my part in this? How is it that I'm losing something in my own life, in my own e efficacy, in the work that I'm trying to do in the world without attacking these issues, not from a place of how is it I'm gonna fix it for folks, but how is it I'm, I am I gonna live, liberate myself so that I can have the life of love and justice that I want for myself? Mm. Exactly. So for me, it's a it's a it's an insurance policy at the very at the least at the very the very, very most basic level that people are admitting to uh, having some skin in the game and wanting to do the work of probing what their part is and how how they actually get into the the questions of how race has lived in their own bodies. Right. Well, <clears throat> I can just say from our our, you know, my own experience working with you and working on these issues, um, it really helps to have a little bit of distance between, you know, your, your reactions, your, you know, because nobody wants to be a racist. Nobody wants to be a white supremacist. Nobody, you know, and there's like a pushing away of any labels and things like that because it can't possibly be me. And yet right. our country from slavery to redlining um, to the creation, government creation, actually, of ghettos, to um, police violence, you know, that we're seeing every single day almost. Like, there's too many systemic things to not see. There's a much bigger picture than whether or not, you know, you're a racist because you use the N-word or you say, you know, like, the, that's the smallest sort of piece of racism in a certain way. But how do you, from Radical Dharma, or your own teaching, how do you help people, what is your advice to people listening who are like, hold it, like white supremacy, institutional racism, that's me? Like, yeah, absolutely. How do, grap how do you grapple with that? How do you have people begin to grapple with your part of a system? Yeah, so I think that this is kind of the practical how is that uh, without the distance that you're talking about, uh, you immediately begin to personalize the conversation in, in the not good ways. So one of the things that people ask, always ask me is, uh, you know, would you say so-and-so is a racist? Would you say, uh, like one of the questions I often get is like, would you say that the police officers that, you know, have, have shot black folks 
black women, black transgender folks and committed this, uh, participated in this kind of violence, or would you say they're racist? And I, I paused for a second. I said, no, I would say, you know, they're not racist. I would say you, you're racist. We're racist. Everybody that's in this room is racist except folks of color because they don't have the power to be racist. You can't be swim in the water and uh, think that you're not, you're not breathing, breathing in the water and you're not fish. The, the racism that uh, pervades this country, the oppression that pervades this country is not because there's some kind of like small freakish group of people in a corner somewhere doing something. Uh, this country was uh, born and bred on the, the falsehood of racism and it's woven into everything that we think about. It's woven into all of the images we see. It's woven into all of our institutions. Uh, literally, we simply can't help in being in a racialized society for everything to be racialized. And it's difficult to hear that if you're not doing the kinds of work that allow you to, to have some distance from the conversation so that you can begin to observe the history and the way in which history has led up to this moment so that we are all uh, actually programmed to view the world in which we live in in terms of a valuing of different bodies in different ways. And so it's not that you are a bad person because you are racist. Uh, you know, those of you that have seen the, uh, the, uh, the uh, video in, um, in which Jay Smooth talks about, you know, ra ra being a racist is, is more like dental hygiene. And what you got to do is you got to keep cleaning your teeth. You got to keep brushing your teeth in order to keep up your hygiene. So you can't just make it go away. This is just the reality of our country. And I think the more and more that we get comfortable in our own skin, and that's why, again, I do contemplative practices or mindfulness practices so that we can have a centering in our own being in order to be able to hear the kind of truths and grapple with the kind of truths that uh, it, unless we confront them and get face to face with them, we allow them to be complicit. And I wanna be really clear about that. So if you're not actually working the anti-racist game and you're not working the anti-oppression game, then you are actually not only, you're not neutral, you're, you actually are complicit with the furthering of racism and systemic oppression in this country. That's the way it was set up. It's just because that's the way that the river flows. And so if all you wanna do is hold your hands up and say, listen, I'm not doing anything. And if I can just be quiet over here, you know, that makes me neutral. It, the fact is, is that you're adding to the force of the river of oppression. And when I say the river of oppression, it's because race is actually tied to the mo most of the major forms of oppression in this country. It always has been and it always will be. And until we unlock racism in this country, what we, are do, what we do is we keep ourselves from navigating the other forms of oppression that racialization was designed to keep in place. Uh, I'll give you an example of that. Uh, you know, back in the, uh, j just when our country was, you know, really, you know, coming together and we were still in colonies, what they realized is that the lower class folks, which include African, uh, the, the African slaves, the immigrants from Ireland, uh, and, and Native folk were getting together and they had an uprising. And a lot of people know about this Bacon's Rebellion in 1676, <clears throat> huge uh, you know, uprising in, in the Virginia colony. And uh, they almost burned the place to the ground. And the governor, William Berkeley of government, uh, you know, realized like we can't have these folks bonding around class. They did not want the owning, the owning class did not wanting, want people that were on the lower, uh, rungs of society to bind. And that was what was what, to, you know, to bond with each other. And that's what was happening. That was our organizing that was going down at the time. You had uh, Bacon organizing the lower classes to rise up against the owning class because we knew who were the real, the people that were really responsible for the degradation, uh, de degraded conditions that people were living under the kind of, uh, you know, you know, the, 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 the echoes of what we see in our society today, the, you know, the, the poor housing, uh, even drug ec epidemic and uh, epidemics of illness, lack of health care, lack of 
uh, sustaining food, all of these things were echoes of what we see happening in the country now. Um, but when they realized that people were going to organize against, organize with each other around classes, what they did is they set up this racialization. And they set up the racialization to ensure that lower class uh, white skinned people at the time, you never talked about people being white. They were Irishmen, they were Englishmen, they were Scottishmen, they were, you know, they were, people were about where they were from. So they set these systems up to basically say to people, listen, if you want to become naturalized citizens, you can't fight alongside the blacks. You can't fight alongside the the natives, uh, because if you do that, then you're not going to be able to get access. In fact, if you refuse to fight, and if you're Christian and you're in good standing and you're a white you, you, and, and, and a man, we're going to give you uh, a gun, we're going to give you land, we're going to give you food, and we're going to make sure that you have the uh, capacity to own property. But the catch is you can't fight alongside the people that are in the same class position that you are. And that started the biggest uh, wedge between people of classes responding and reacting to the low, to the upper class, to the owning class. And we have that to this day. We have rural communities, rural white communities that actually vote against their own interests to this day because it was set up in our system that it was better to be poor than it was to be black, that it was better to be poor than it was to be indigenous, that it was better to be poor and white than it was to be anything else. And so to this day, we're not organizing. To this day, white women don't organize alongside, until we had the Women's March, alongside uh, colored women against patriarchy because you needed your man, you needed the support of your man, you needed the support of your of 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 the of the man in the house, and so you would subject have yourself subject to patriarchy. You would have yourself subject even to race uh, to to rape, rather than to be in a position in which you may be kicked out. And uh, the worst thing you could possibly be was black. So we have the vestiges in this country, and that's the thing that I want people to, if you don't walk away with anything else, is the thing I always say is that it's not your fault, but it is your responsibility. And Radical Dharma talks a lot about the underpinnings of the ways in which we have been set up in order to buy into these ideas. And we start to think that they're our own. I've got a dear friend and he, uh, he has this quote, and I always forget who the quote is from, but I'm going to quote him. He's He's Greg, Greg Snyder, and he's a priest at Brooklyn Zen Center. And he says, you know, we have um, a lot of people talk about their, their personal thoughts. And he said, there's no such things as, as personal thoughts. We have private thoughts. All of the thoughts what we have, all of the uncomfortable, weird, biased mm -hmm. thoughts that you have, all of the ways in which you other people is something that you inherited there's nothing private, there's nothing personal about your thoughts. They're collective thoughts. All of them are collective thoughts. And so if you kind of get yourself caught up in a sense of guilt about the ways in which you do notice that you have your experience bias, the ways in which you do notice that you're thinking, well, you know, should I be worried about the Muslims? You know, really? Uh, the way that you do look across and you see a brother and you, and you, and you may be like, uh, you know, reach for the door lock. So you kind of look around and you feel nervous. What you've got to understand, uh, wherever you are in society, whether you're you're a white woman, whether you're a white man, or whether you're people of color, you know, other people of color and, you know, cross race, uh, cross, cross, cross ethnicity bias and othering. It's not your fault that you have these, uh, these thoughts. It's, it, it was set up like this. And I can't, say in, in any more uncertain and, and uh, emphatic terms that until we really allow ourselves to take it in, that our country was designed in this way, that our very government designed the system in such a way that really leaves it actually, leaves us uh, in a position in which it's difficult to escape 
othering people as the way in which we function. I mean, as human beings, we other people as a way of survival because noticing sameness is a way in which we notice a kind of safety and security. But what actually happened in terms of our uh, government and the way that the structures of racialization were set up and, uh, and locked into, interlocked with other forms of oppression is that we were systematically taught, particularly white folks were systematically taught to disengage from their recognition of the humanity of other people. And that is the most devastating thing that could have happened. Because what it means is it's not just that people got privileges and they got benefits, but they traded those privileges and those benefits for be their own humanity. And as human beings, we can't compartmentalize that. And so we have histories of violence and aggression that still persist uh, right into the police forces of the United States that we were set up for. So it's not like the police that are, are going to the force thinking like, I wanna like hate on black people. I wanna hate on Latinos. I wanna go and beat these people. You know, I'm part of a civil service family and, I, and, and my family went into uh, the police force and into the, the fire, fire department eventually because they wanted to serve and protect. But when you have a system that is set up so that people are uh, oriented to basically fear a black body, you know, it's just like you're running up against this wall and the only way that you can pierce this is if you're willing to do the work that allows you to recognize the way in which that racialization, that oppression, that othering, that anti-Muslim sentiment, that uh, 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 looking down on women and thinking they're not, you know, equal to you lives inside of your body. And you got to have the kind of hard conversations where you deal with the discomfort and you deal with the face-to-face -face, uh, with white folk, with other white folks, with white men, with heterosexual white men that allow you to begin to confront this. And can you, Angel, can you give us some, some examples from your work of practically, like it's very hard, I can speak for myself as a white male, um, to begin to face some of the systemic you know, things and even just the thoughts that you have. We have yep. all been programmed along these lines. And once you gain some awareness, you actually will see some scary thoughts in your own mind happening around issues of equity. But how, how you know, in an organization that's working on you know, social justice issues, I mean, what are the practical steps that you can take um, from radical Dharma to start surfacing some of this and, and creating a space where it's safe enough for people to face some of this really, really hard stuff. Because if we don't, we're not going to get anywhere on it. So how, <clears throat> how do we do that? Yeah, I, you know, I think the, uh, the earliest things that, you know, first of all, your interest is, uh, is, is huge, right? The fact that you're interested in the fact that you're showing up for the conversation uh, and beginning to, and, and being, be, beginning to will, willing to contemplate the idea, you know, I'm racist and I've got racist thoughts and to begin to um, start to be able to confront those and give yourself some space, some permission and some forgiveness, really. Uh, I think a really key part of this is, and, and particularly La Mirad talks about this, is the healing that is necessary for us to forgive ourselves for the fact that we have been caught up and we have been, uh, programmed, as I said, to uh, think and feel in, in these ways. But if we try to remain in, in these sort of like self-righteous locations where we've got our finger pointed and we're trying to police other people, uh, we will not recognize that for the distraction that it is of dealing with our own discomfort. And that's why I think a mindfulness practice is critical uh, because it allows us to develop the sense of 
the being able to see the feelings that arise, you know, as you talked about, Todd, to have those difficult feelings and to notice them and, you know, rather than clamp down on them, rather than suppress them, rather than to kind of get into a, a place in which you're insisting that that can't possibly be me, just to entertain the question, right? And to, to notice uh, for, for yourself, I would say, you know, to probe in particular for white folks, like what does it mean to be white? And what has whiteness meant to me? And what has whiteness uh, gained for me? And what cost has that been, at, at what cost has that been for other people? What does it mean that, that you as a white person uh, can have, you know, grown up to an, an adult point in your life, recognize the enormous health disparities, mm -hmm. the enormous education disparities, the more the enormous uh, disparities in work, the uh, imbalances in terms of like who holds positions and what positions of power that they hold in your organization. Here's the question you want to ask yourself. What did you think was going on with those folks? Either you believe that they are actually inferior and that's why they don't hold equal positions of power and that they're not entitled to equal positions of power, why they live in ghettos, why they live under these health disparities with lower lifespans, uh, why people live in, why one in three black men will spend some time in jail in America in 2017. Uh, either you believe they are inferior or you believe it is the system. Now, if you don't believe it's they're inferior and you do believe it's the system, then you have to step into the belief that if the system has been able to uh, maintain this over 375 years, 300 to 75 to, to uh, 400 years, you have to stop believing that the system is broken and have to start to come to the recognition that the system is working exactly as it should be. Mm -hmm. And when start with that starting point, these two major starting points, that A, the system is working as it should be, and B, that I have been complicit in keeping the system in its place. You get the kind of core, um, I want to say set points, organizing principles of reevaluating the life that you're living and looking at the world through different eyes. And I think that those two things are critical. And I, but I want to say, like, put your life jacket on first before you go and start trying to help other people. And for me, that life jacket is to get a practice that enables you to create the distance so you don't freak out uh, every time the information starts to hit you. Because I tell you, when you start to look around, and even as a woman of color in a that, that uh, a queer woman of color in this body, when I started to recognize the ways in which I was complicit in racism, it is devastating. So I can't even begin to understand what it would be like for white folks to be able to confront the reality that this has been going on all their lives, generation after generation, and somehow they hadn't seen the depths of it. Somehow on a day-to-day -day basis, they don't recognize the way in which they play a role. So get your life vest, get your practice of being able to create a kind of distance. I don't talk about race and I'm not talking about oppression so that people can feel bad about themselves. I always say, if you wanna feel guilty, which I think is a distraction, you can write it. You can write me a check. I can give you my address at the at, at the end of this. I'll give you my PayPal address. And if you feel really guilty and you really want to wallow around racism, you can write me a big check with more zeros on the end of it. Uh, guilt and uh, shame are actually the tools and the weapons of white supremacy, and they are designed to keep white folks quiet. They are designed to keep them from being able to probe what's going on, to question what's going on. And the next step is once you have these organizing principles is to begin to intervene and to ask questions. You've got to be willing to ask the kinds of questions of like, hey, what is going on here? But in order to ask those questions, you've got to be able to uh, be willing to make mistakes. And as we know, we have this concept of white fragility in which uh, whiteness and the and when I say whiteness, I don't mean white people. I mean the construct of whiteness that 
uh, white skinned European descended people have been kind of like dragged into belief in this idea of a construct of whiteness that never existed before this country uh, fully entered it into the lexicon of uh, its legal its legal structures. You've got to be able to separate yourself as a human being from this construct of whiteness and start to question it seriously. Yeah, well, oh, and I want to say, and people of color have to be able to uh, start to probe the way in which the construct of, of whiteness has become the epitome of beauty, of perfection, of access. Uh, and, and everything that is supposed to be right and good in the world and figure out where that has been internalized and lodged in your body so that we have been set upon to dislike each other, to uh, judge each other, and to fight against uh, 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 the, the, the pe other people of brown, black, red, and yellow skin uh, in order to continue to uphold white supremacy. So we've got to do that work for ourselves instead of spending too much time pointing and, and looking at white folks and, and telling them what they ought to be doing. Hmm. That's great. And we have a lot of questions from the audience. And yeah, let's I would get love, to them. I'd love to just keep going, but I'm going to share you, Angel. Um, okay. Ann is going to take over. I'm going to disappear for a little bit and we'll get to your questions. Okay, great. I'm going to queue up Manuel and TiVo. And um, so we, I'm going to make you a panelist and then you can actually choose if you want to be on camera too. Um, and so uh, give me a moment to uh, queue you both up here. And Manuel, can you, uh, let's see if we can hear you. Sometimes it takes a second. I have to be a little patient here. Let's see if I can see him. Looks like, Man looks like Manuel's on uh, on uh, mute there, Manuel. Let's see. Oh yeah. Let me see if I can. Manuel, let's see if you can un. Let's see if I can unmute you and we can hear you. <laughs> And in the meantime, I, I love, you know, y'all check out the Twitter feed. Queer Body Love is, uh, is uh, tweeting away. Thanks so much. And I appreciate that. And uh, I'm at Zen Change Angel. So if y'all want to like drop me some questions over Twitter as well, you can do that. All right. And Manuel, you're off mute. Go ahead. Great. Manuel, can we uh, want to ask your question? I can hear you really faintly. Okay. I'm sorry. Oh, shoot. Okay, I'm gonna ask your question for you. I'm sorry, we can just hear you. So here's, here's your question. Uh, so what's the difference in racism between racism and being racist? Institutional racism, um, is it part of systemic or structural? Uh, so I've got a great, um, uh, definition here for for race let me start with just race so uh, this this is from Ronald Chisholm and Michael Washington who um, started the undoing racism training race is a specious a specious means false class, false that that is made to sound true a specious classification of human beings created by Europeans whites which assigns human worth and social status using white as the model of humanity and the height of human achievement for the purpose of establishing of maintaining privilege and power and I repeat that last phrase for the purpose of establishing and maintaining privilege and power that is to say that race was only created for the purpose of establishing and maintaining privilege and power and the way that they talk about uh, racism is racism is is race plus power so racism is an institution that is designed to uh is is the the formation that is designed to keep power in place the difference of so and, and if you if you ask what is a racist hey, angel hold that thought for one second somehow your volume got really quiet too can you uh, maybe adjust your microphone just a little bit uh I don't think, I don't know if I can do anything. Let's see. Yeah. Seems, 
I hear you well. Yeah. Is that any better? Yes. Thank you. So, uh, so you know, racist is a, is in in the theory the belief right in 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 race right. So if you just take an is right, it's like it's the belief in race. Well, everybody in this country fundamentally believes in race, and if not uh, in an express explicit well, in an implicit way, meaning that we're all in, inhabiting a racialized society. Our thoughts are racialized. And I know there are people that talk about being uh, colorblind. You could be colorblind, but the fact and the, the pernicious fact of race and how it shows up in terms of its distribution of, uh, of power, keeping power um, amongst white skinned people and keeping uh, uh, or, or attempting to, to persistently keep black, brown, yellow, people people and uh, indigenous people down is uh, consistent. And so, you know, really all of us in this country are uh, part of racialization. It's the, the fact that white people have the power in order to be uh, lifted up and have the privilege of what that racialization means is what it is to be a racist. Great. Manuel, thank you for your question. We're gonna move to TiVo. I'm gonna try to unmute you. How's that? Yeah, we, we got a bunch of folks saying that they can't hear. And uh, so Rana and uh, Mary Ruth, if you would just uh, let us know again, if uh, you're still not able to hear, they said suddenly it went very quiet. Yeah, I think that was before the microphone fix. Hopefully that's true. Okay. Let us know if it's a good, good idea though. Let us know if it's better now. Are you gonna bring TiVo up? I think we should be able to hear TiVo. Tivo, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yes, speak um, speak as loudly as you can, though. Sorry about that. Oh, uh, that's okay. So, you know, so in addition to the mindfulness practice and the embodiment practice, and I would, what I would say, the unlearning, the trauma and the beliefs, it seems like an important piece is building a new story. So I just wanted to get a, a kind of an insight into how that builds into the approach. So are you saying TiVo building a new story? Yes. Yeah, I, you know, and that's why I talk about uh, this notion of a new America, because I think that we can't really build a new story on the foundation of this old story. If the story began with a, a very limited number of people in a, in a very particular type of body uh, and that this country was designed for, designed to, um, to, to, to uplift, uh, to further the lives and enhance the life of, until we re, uh, reestablish a new story, a new America that uh, includes the voices of all of us because you know who tells the story matters. And so uh, black folks never told this story, Latinos never told this story, uh, indigenous folks haven't told the story that we are all uh, being fed in America. So we actually, Muslims have not been uh, part of telling the story. So until we construct a new story for of a new America and we do that collectively, that acknowledges our history, that acknowledges the context in which this country came into being, we won't have the voices of the people that um, are currently showing up and making this country the great country that it is. This country has never been great without the people that I mentioned. It has never been great without queer folks. It has never been great without the Chinese that built the railroads, without the Japanese that uh, came and you know farmed the gorgeous land here, without the uh, the 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 Mexican people the, that the border crossed over and then land was given wholesale to. Those people's stories need to be part of our stories. I'll say for myself that I don't know enough of those stories and I know a pretty good amount. And so absolutely, we need a new story. We need a new America and we need an America that has the vision that includes all of us. It includes the people that live in rural uh, white America that are being you know, subject to the devastation of an opioid epidemic that comes from, I think, the deep denial that exists around racialization in this country. 
and the experience of a loss of power and place because the country has been in denial for so long. So I want a story that includes them too. I want a new America that in, makes room for them so that they can thrive. I want a, a, a story and a new America that makes room for the indigenous people of this country, recognizing that they have not disappeared. Uh, I want a new America story that acknowledges that this country is nothing made of, uh, overwhelmingly made of immigrants and not the, not just the people that are recently in the border, but that the only uh, truly indigenous people to this country are the Native Americans and First Nations people on the land of, 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 of North America. So we absolutely need to fashion a new story and a new America. I'm all about the hashtag new America so that we can uh, stop traumatizing ourselves, stop traumatizing Latinos, stop traumatizing Black folks, um, having them be believe in this false belief of a founding father that ever you know, gave a shit about any of us uh, that, that even cared about the white women in this country. We have to stop believing in this false ideology. It's like um, having uh, someone that abused you be uh, invited into, you know, the and, and be the foundation of the story that you tell about yourself over and over again when actually they were your abusers, they were your captures, captors, uh, they were the people that devastated your people, that destroyed the stories that were true to your culture. So we have to let that old story go, get out of the denial, and allow ourselves to inhabit the truth and fullness of our humanity, and in including the ways in which we have been complicit because the ways in which we've made mistakes or misstepped or we've been caught in these lies is part of our story too. But that's the way that we begin to heal. That's the way we begin to work with forgiveness. That's the way we look across the table at each other and we start to embrace the humanity that exists in all of us uh, when we tell this new story. So thanks TiVo for as asking that question. Thank you. Great, and um, I'm going to queue up Diagon and CG next. And while I queue them up, we had an anonymous question, Angel, that I wanted to um, have you have you examine. How do you reconcile the Buddhist teaching that mind precedes everything with the reality of systemic oppression? That mind precedes everything. Yeah, that's how it's written here. Yeah, mind is a construct, you know, and uh, the way I have uh, often talked about it is that whiteness is a construct just like mind is. And so whiteness precedes everything in this country. And I think it's exactly like mind in that sense, in that, uh, in other words, the, the, um, the delusion of that construct uh, inhibits us from being able to live reality. And the reality, I think, for all of us uh, truly as human beings is the reality of, of, of our touching into our humanity where we begin to recognize and see each other and see that we share in suffering, that we are not separate from each other. But this construct of whiteness, just like the construct of mine, inhibits us from being able to touch that reality. And uh, in the Buddhist idea that to return to touching our suffering and to allow our individual selves to experience directly our own suffering is to allow us to touch into the suffering of all beings, is to allow us to touch into, to feel the suffering of the very earth and the planet and the, the devastation that we visit upon the planet. But we can't do that if we are being uh, inhibited from touching that reality because the construct of mind is trying to protect ourselves from feeling bad, from feeling unhappy, from feeling um, discomfort, or on the other hand is luring us into and seducing us into only you know, getting caught up in our desires, only getting caught up in uh, what it is that we want. So we kind of live in this state according to the Buddhist uh, sensibility and, and understanding in this constant state of grasping after things or, of, or being adverse to the reality that we experience. And so presence, however you, however you relate to uh, Buddhism or Christianity or uh, being Muslim, 
presidents is kind of the grand central station of all of us meeting the truth of who we are. And when we meet the truth of who we are, when we navigate the suffering that we feel, when we navigate the part of ourselves that we cut off, that we left behind, the queer part of ourselves, the, um, the, um, the uh, under, underdeveloped aspects of ourselves as men because patriarchy told us that we had to leave that part at the door, otherwise we weren't truly men. Uh, the part of ourselves that we left at, at the door as queer people because we felt like we weren't entitled to the same kind of access that hetero people were, the kind of um, parts of ourselves that we leave behind even as people that are differently abled because the uh, larger abled society would say that we are somehow diminished or less than because we are, are differently abled. We have to go and touch the suffering of both what it means to have that uh, those experiences visited upon us and to go through the healing process of allowing ourselves to become whole in just exactly who we are. Great. Dagon, thanks for turning your webcam on. I'm going to unmute you. It's nice to see you. Hi, thanks, Angel. I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit to um, the the ways in which the, the white supremacy and, and capitalism are playing out within the queer community to perpetuate the separation, specifically around the idea that, oh, we all have to come together or we can't, you know, adding stripes to the flag is disrespectful or whatever, you know, I mean, I've been hearing so many excuses and, and as I continue to do the work and try to inspire others to do the work, I'm getting so much pushback and I'm just wondering if you can speak a little bit to that yeah, you know, I think that Doug and, uh, and it's great to see you. I it's uh, you know, we have to in in the process of uh, doing this difficult work recognize that our brothers and sisters, and our uh, non-gender conforming folks, uh, are are you know as I said earlier hoodwinked and bamboozled, and we we have to have a kind of a patience, um, and extend space. Uh, for people and the recognition that, you know, this kind of spiritual bypassing, this I, this bypassing, and uh, I, I, when I say spiritual, I don't mean of a religious nature. I mean um, as as in the the very fact of the things that give rise to life. This identity this identity crisis that we're in is easier to bypass that and say, hey, let's just like all you know get together, than to confront how truly painful it is to recognize that we have lost something of ourselves, that, that there's something in us that uh, makes us disregard the humanity of others. And so we just want to like, you know, push the pedal to the metal and get, be get beyond and get on the other side. Um, you know, I connect with the, the sense of pain and the ways in which I didn't want to confront that when I realized that, you know, the, the colorism that existed and that was part of my upbringing. My father's dark, my father, my mother's fair, but I had the uh, colorism of, you know, that, that uh, permeates a lot of uh, communities of color, you know, deeply ingrained in me. And it wasn't until a very, you know, dear friend that I loved, uh, you know, stopped me and it was, he was, uh, he was gay and uh, we were I tell the story often that we were uh, getting ready to go somewhere else. He was a, a dark skinned brother and, and gay. And, and I was saying, you know, hey, Kim, stop primping. And uh, he turned around and looked at me. He's very serious in his face. And he said, you know, you're fair skin. He said, I'm dark skin. He said, I can't go any place. My brother taught me I can't go any place not being clean and looking clean because the, the reality that I face is different than the one that you face. And, you know, I'm paraphrasing it. But that's what he said. And so I know how painful it was for me to confront that. And so I just want to say that I know it's difficult when your brothers and sisters, you know, you want to get them on the program and you got to give people space to come to a place. You, you got to keep nudging them and to, to get woke. Uh, but you have to have some compassion for them, too, and recognize that it is deep that the um, impulse to hide behind all sorts of forms of like kumbaya and together and let's not, let's just all get along is uh, deeply ingrained because what it means is that people have to confront the truths of their lives of what they left behind, what they cut off, 
what they are allowing every day to happen in their own lives right now. And um, I would be in the questioning phase and say, you know, what is it that might, you might be leaving behind? And uh, let's not talk so much about like, hey, go out there and confront racism and oppression, uh, and oppression but ask, what is it that you have left behind? What, what of yourself is being left behind that you may not be confronting right now? Because I guarantee you that that is what is keeping them with their foot on the brake, trying to bypass as quickly as they can the acknowledgement uh, that we are uh, in a shit show right now in terms of oppression, and we have all been participating, and we've all got something to pick up and, and turn over and look at in order to uh, find our way into the radical dharma, into the whole truth of um, how it is that we've been playing a part. And also, the, the, that do same uh, radical dharma is the doorway to the liberation so that we can figure out how to be a part of this conversation. Thank you. Yeah. All right, Dargon, thank you very much. And we're going to bring up um, CG. I'm going to unmute you. Good, another brave webcam. <laughs> Hello, can you hear me? We can. Great. This is Genevieve, and I'm in Seattle. And I'm looking forward to being with you, Reverend Angel, in December. And I'm involved with organizing several facilitated book groups using Radical Dharma, some POC book groups and some multiracial book groups as well. And we're looking at uh, this um, part on policing. We've had some, unfortunately, in the last couple of weeks, we've had instances where POC um, community members have been shot and, and killed by police. And so we're using this unfortunate circumstances to look at our own tendency to police ourselves and others um, and looking at specific ways that we can use Dharma practices and rituals to, um, then to notice how and where we police in our, in our own lives and in our bodies and how we can use uh, these practices to move towards acceptance of ourselves and others and healing around our tendencies, our ingrained tendencies to police. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, the ingrained tendencies are pretty deeply ingrained. Uh, you know, similar to what I was saying to Gdaigen is that that bypass has everything to do with the bypassing our own pain. Um, I want to say that, you know, to all the Dharma communities, the yoga communities, uh, we get a little over the top about like, what can we do with these practices? And let's just say that, you know, oppression and racism preceded the Dharma in this country. So let's just start there, folks, and not get too crazy and recognize that we have uh, resources and information that's going to have to be outside of Buddhist practices and uh, yoga practices in order for us to get the kind of information that we need that is in context uh, in, in order for us to, to really dig down into the, you know, the history and the context. That said, you know, part of the reason that I wrote Radical Dharma, uh, that uh, Lama Rod and Dr. Yasmin were a part of uh, co-authoring uh, Radical Dharma is because exactly because it was the practices of liberation that invites us to look fiercely into the truth of our experience that uh, really pushed each one of us to deeply have these conversations and to confront the ways in which we ourselves are part of experiencing in the, the kind of experiencing we're having in terms of racialization, but also the ways in which we are complicit in things like policing other people. Uh, and, and the, the thing is, and that was the, one of the key things in terms of the title of radical Dharma is that you can't take the Dharma, you can't take the truth, you can't take the teachings and say, okay, I'm only going to apply them to the areas in my life in which it's comfortable for me to look at. I'm only going to apply it to the areas that are uh, personal to me, but rather I'm going to take a lens to society. I'm going to take a lens into to the ways in which um, I show up and to the ways in which I have formed this community when I look around the place. Uh, and so I think, you know, we have these practices and what they invite is they invite us to 
to, to look clearly, to see clearly and, and look around us. And I, I can't tell you exactly what it is that you're looking clearly at because that's individual and specific to each community. But to, uh, I, I always say that when you feel the impulse to look outside, if you can turn that impulse around and say, what is it that I'm avoiding? That's the beginning question, right? When I have the impulse to go and police someone, what I, what I do is say, what is it that I'm avoiding confronting in myself? Now, there's a difference between being discerning and naming something and calling something and being honest about, uh, you know, uh, recognizing what's in the room and the, the compulsion that is very much a part of our society to other someone, to uh, try to bring them down in some way, to uh, use the back of someone else to, to stand up on and to, and to highlight yourself and to make yourself right. And that's what policing uh, always mm -hmm. looks like. And so it, it's the quality and, and really what I wanna to say to you, CG, is that it is the, uh, the practice of the conversation. It's not, these are not one-off things that you can suddenly you know, jump up and say, okay, I've got the answer, we've had a conversation. To have a radical dharma, to, to discover your radical truth, to discover what is like deep down inside of you and your communities and the ways in which they've been constructed and uh, someone, uh, you know, invited me to say to say light skin rather than fair skin. So I'll say, you know, I'll say light skin uh, or less melanated. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, welcome all the things. Um, you know, we we it it is an ongoing conversation because as I've said over and over again, you know, we, there's a 375 year year momentum, and this is not going to sol be solved in one conversation. It's not going to be about like one reading group, uh, but it is going to be about us rolling up our sleeves and leaning in and being able to get down with each other and and have the hard questions. Thank you. Yeah. Anne? Anne, I think you're on, um, you're on. Uh, I am on mute, thank you. you. <laughs> yeah. um, sorry about that. Um, we have a lot of great questions. We're probably gonna run out of time before we get to all of them. And Angel, I wanted to check in. Um, Todd was thinking that we should probably do a practice too. I wanted to ask your thoughts on that. We have about, you know, 17 minutes or so. Yeah. Uh, so what, one of the things that I want to do to make sure that we do before we go is that, you know, obviously this is a web format and there's a bunch of questions and I love that people are asking, uh, you know, so many uh, questions um, and that I would love to be able to get to. And um, I, I can't answer them in the full on way that I, that I would like to, but I would like to let everybody know that uh, we have a couple of uh, different ways in which you can engage Radical Dharma directly. And uh, we're finally going to begin the process, which I'm really, really looking forward to, of um, connecting people that have had Radical Dharma groups together. You can go on my website and get some more information. In order to get some more information, just go on the contact page there. Uh, but we have a couple of events that are coming up. And uh, whether you're living East or West, is something for you to engage in. Uh, the first thing, and let me just see if I can uh, share my screen right quick here. Here we go. Uh, the first thing we have is uh, in the um, West Coast, the uh, next thing that's gonna be coming up in July 26th, I'll be at the Shambhala Mountain Center with both, Dr., with, uh, both Lama Rod and also Dr. Yasmin, and we're going to be doing a living radical Dharma retreat. And that should be a really, really, uh, not only um, fantastic and powerful retreat, but also on really gorgeous land. And it's in the mountains of Colorado. So if you're over here in the West Coast, or you're willing to come on over here in the West Coast, uh, we're being hosted by Shambhala Mountain Center. And uh, this is, is gonna be especially powerful for people that come from uh, Sangha's uh, yoga, spiritual interfaith and different faith communities. Uh, it's it's open to all. It's a it's a Shambhala um, land-based center, but it's open to everyone. 
And immediately after that, uh, also here on the West Coast, we go to the gorgeous uh, Tassajara Zen Mountain Center. Uh, there's a couple of folks that were, uh, you know, had questions here that uh, are part of the San Francisco Zen Center system. Um, and again, this is open to all, and I do this with uh, Abbas Fu Schroeder uh, from Green Gulch, and I'm really, really looking forward to that. And this is about embodying race, love, and liberation. So it, it really is going to take us into figuring out how it is that we embody this idea of a, a radical dharma. Oh, it, it's, this says met, <laughs> mountains of, of Colorado, but that's not in the mountains of Colorado. That's in the the mountains of, uh, uh, of Tassajara, and it is a beautiful place. Anybody knows about the Tassajara Hot Springs, uh, please do come and join us there. And the big, big National uh, Radical Dharma Camp is gonna be taking place August 4th through 6th in um, Rhinebeck, New York. We're being hosted by Omega Institute, who have been fantastic partners, both the Omega Women's Leadership Center and also Omega Institute. And this is the big national gathering for people that have started Radical Dharma reading groups, and they are ready to take it to the next level to have uh, in-person direct experience. Again, both uh, Dr. Yasmin and Lama Rod will be there, and we'll, we'll all be holding a kind of um, broad caucus to figure out what are the next steps for Radical Dharma, how do we seed Radical Dharma cam conversations in communities, what does it look like in other faith traditions, in yoga communities, uh, in uh, regular communities, your, in your churches? Uh, we, we really want to bring people together and set ambassadors out into the world to bring this radical dharma into the way that it looks. I like to say that radical dharma is the kind of occupy of oppression and racism in this country, and we want to have people make it there. So please do join us for the Radical Dharma National Camp. You can, if you're interested in volunteering, you can also go on the website and my website, angelkyotowilliams.com slash contact uh, and uh, find me there and uh, let's get you involved in some way. So I, def I definitely wanted to say that, that there are ways to continue to engage and um, you can, uh, you know, continue to send me the questions that you have. Uh, I won't be able to get to them in the same way. That's why we do the the webinar so that we get the opportunity to do some more in-depth uh, questions and answers here. Uh, but I do, but I do want to invite people to come along and uh, come to these in person because this is where we really move the needle, folks. And I think that this year is an incredible time to move the needle. Uh, we know that we're up against uh, a whole lot of stuff that's going on and been in, you know, dragging a lot of people down and it's time for us to pick ourselves up and do the work that is necessary. We've got a few more years um, to, 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 to be able to work and it's time for us to just not like address these things with merely political situ uh, political situations, but to but to to really meet the situation uh, where it really lives, which is at the core of our hearts and minds, uh, to address these questions of I identity, to address the questions of denial that we have been living with in this country for all of these years. Uh, so the civil rights movement was, was, is, of course, laudable, and we always want to uh, deeply appreciate the power. Um, but, you know, a lot of the civil rights folks that we, that we know of and we love and we supported kn knew that there was a lot of uh, work to be done. Uh, white supremacy is pernicious and it has an incredible ability to keep morphing. These days, we're seeing a, a raw and ragged version of it, but we've got those of us that uh, believe in love and justice, as I know all of you do if you're on this call, have got to get it out of our own hearts and, and do the practice and uh, get in the conversation in a way that lets us get free, get liberated ourselves so that we can take it to the next level. Um, and, you know, and before you go, there's one question that I definitely want to respond. Uh, it's from Michael, uh, a human that is here. And I see the tail end of the question is to talk about where do we begin with people who are not ready to engage. And I want to say uh, two things for people. Listen, 
there's a lot of uh, attention that we put on, like try to do the hardest thing that we can possibly do first or what seems like the hardest thing and it's out there somewhere. When people are not ready to engage, move the conversation to the people that are uh, that are, are situated in love and have your conversation begin to engage in the places where there is some love, where there is some readiness, where there is some movement. Believe me that when the net, the networks of people that are doing their own work begin to ripple out, we'll touch those people that seem like they're not ready to engage. This is a conversation about moving hearts. And this is a conversation that goes deep to the core of people's identity. And we don't know what kind of uh, pain and suffering we're touching when we have these kinds of conversations, which is why everybody freak, ha, ha, you know, used to freak out. And I'm really pleased to see the ways in which we can have a conversation and say white supremacy and, and know these days that we're not just talking about folks in hoods and that and we have come a really really long way but we want to make sure that what we're not trying to do is to police people or to arm wrestle people into conversations now when you're in situations in which you've got institutions in which people are holding power and you're part of those institutions in your community there is a certain um impetus for trying to uh push at those communities i would say <coughs> excuse me, and push at those levels of power, <coughs> excuse me, I would say to start with uh, inviting people into the conversation. Uh, and when they're not ready, you got to get with folks and band your arms together and uh, insist. Because if we don't insist with inside of our institutions, inside of our organizations, inside of the um, uh, inside of the communities in which people are holding on to power desperately, if we don't insist, then we might have to like pick ourselves up and go someplace else. What, you, what we don't want to do is continue to martyr ourselves in such a way where we are broken by these conversations. So get yourself fortified with love, grab arms with someone that is willing to have these conversations with you and don't go it alone. Uh, for Radical Dharma, we are expecting to put out a curriculum that's going to help a lot of you folks. And so uh, make sure you sign up, uh, get on the Radical Dharma mailing list, and uh, we'll, we'll move that forward too. Beautiful, Angel. Thank you so much. That, that touched on several questions, including Chris. Yeah, a bunch of them trying to do that. <laughs> that, was, that was very well done. Um, do you want to lead us in a in a brief practice and and then we'll bring Todd back for some final thoughts. Yeah, sure. You know, um, I, I want to bring us into a practice. Uh, I often do this practice uh, about centering presence. And the reason that I it particularly offer this is it really has come out of my own experience of my radical Dharma is to uh, bring myself as present as I possibly can in an embodied way so that I am not uh, organizing myself around looking outside someplace else uh, before I have this conversation. I do the centering practice as I want to say an act of leadership and love and commitment to justice in uh, before entering any kind of conversations with people entering into new meetings. I did it before getting onto this call and uh, you know getting set up with Ann and Todd here. And so uh, it's really brief and, you know, um, it, it, it involves us, you know, being able to bring ourselves back fully present. Uh, I'm going to run through it quickly. There's, if you want more information about it, do sign up on our mailing list and, uh, or the contact list and ask for information. We just uh, filmed a full version of the centering practice, but here's a brief one. First, you want to find your feet wherever you are, whether you're standing or sitting. I love that CG called in from uh, a uh, uh, from a car <laughs> and pulled out, looks like pulled over on the side of the road there. I you want to begin by finding your seat and uh, finding your feet. And when you find your feet, what you're doing is sending like a tap root down, recognizing that each of us are connected to the earth and it is one of the ways in which we can tap into our relationship with the planet and uh, recognize that we're not separate from the planet, that we are a, a direct part of the earth 
here. And so uh, by finding our feet and getting them underneath us, we establish our sense of uh, being connected to the root of all things. And next you wanna find your seat. And to find your seat is to really locate yourself in space and to, uh, if you're sitting, whether you're sitting in a chair, you wanna have your pelvis slightly tilted forward or if you're standing, you wanna have your tailbone so that it just uh, drops down and is uh, level with the earth and uh, bringing your pelvic girdle underneath you so that you're not kind of pitched forward or pitched back. And that really enables us to get our sense of security and safety in the space that's around us. Next, you wanna find your length and use your out breath to extend your crown all the way up to the sky. And we talk about our sense of dignity that is found when we extend into our length, whether standing or sitting. And that dignity is something that oppression robs from us or attempts to rob from us. And when it does, we can feel the full length of our body and recognize that the dignity that we have is inherent to who we are, that the fact that we breathe makes us worthy and that we always have this, in, this dignity in our bodies, in our beings, and we can extend right into the fullness of the length of our body to feel into that dignity. And then we wanna feel into the full width of our body. And when we do that, extending into our width, what we feel is our heart gets exposed. And so you get this feeling of your uh, heart exposed right here with my, my radical dharma sweatshirt. I feel that uh, exposure of my heart, which always has this little moment of when I feel that width of like, whoa, oh, you know, I'm, I'm here with people. And I can feel my own shoulders from left to right and then feel, feel the space around me. And if there's anyone in the room around on either side of me, I feel and include them in my space. And I choose to take up in my width the whole space of the room that I'm in. Knowing that I am connected to the space, to the people, whether present in the room with me, but also the ones that are not present and feel the expansiveness of what it means to be in relationship with others. And from my exposed uh, heart, I drop down into my soft belly and right around to the back, feeling my full depth by feeling everything that's behind me, the chair that's underneath me. And recognize that behind me are all of my ancestors, the ones known and unknown, the ones that I choose in my life. And in front of me are the future generations that each of us do our work on behalf of. And in our depth, what we do is we choose to take up our place right here and right now. And so we feel that depth in our connection of the past to the future, but also allowing ourselves to be fully in our depth in this moment, because the present is the only place in which we can do our work. And finally, we connect to what matters to us why we would do the difficult work of facing oppression, why we do the difficult work of unearthing the racism, the bias, the white supremacy that we have inherited, that we have internalized in our body. We do that for a reason. It's not just to be good people, but we do it because we want to live, we want to thrive, 
We want to love and there's something, there's someone that wakes us up in the morning, that moves us, that gets us out of bed. And we wanna to connect to that as the reason that we commit ourselves to justice, that we commit ourselves to love, that we commit ourselves to the hard work. Because if we wanna enter these conversations and we do it without anchoring it to a real reason, to something that really sets us on fire, that makes us get out there, that motivates us to connect with the world, if we do it without that, then we do it and we get lost in the head and we're not dropped down into embodied experience of what it is that is uh, important to us, what it is that matters to us. And that's where we wanna do any of this work from centering it on what matters, centering it on love, because that's the only way in which we are going to assure that the work that we, are, we do is about justice. And if you haven't done it yet, just pull up the corners of your mouth and make sure that you are smiling and staying in joy. There's a whole lot of suffering out there and we're not going to pass through it or override it. We're gonna have our joy. We're gonna have our love in the face of suffering. And we're gonna to continue to move forward from that place together. Thanks so much. Oh, Reverend Angel. Uh, Suzanne, thank you so much. I'll just um, bring, I think, um, I just saw a flash of, okay, good. There you go, we got a flash of Todd. Yeah. Flash of Todd. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Reverend Angel. Um, and thanks for so many, you know, hundreds of people participating in this. We have information which we'll be sending out, the face-to-face -face Radical Dharma sessions. The book is available on Amazon.com and other places, I'm sure. I don't know if you have a preferred place that people go get this. Go to your local bookstores and tell them that we need a radical dharma in a bookstore, folks. Uh, we, you know, we, 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 we appreciate Amazon, but we want to love up on the local bookstores, but we've got to invite them to carry the, uh, the, the books, the information, ask them for James Baldwin, ask them for radical dharma, ask them for uh, the law, the, the color of law that tells you about the the history of uh, the New Deal and how it was never made for, and it was in, kept away from people of color, black folks in this country. Uh, get the books that you need, get them in your local bookstores and uh, get together and sit together and have those conversations. Great, thank you so much, Reverend Angel and for everyone who participated. And uh, we hope to have Reverend Angel back again at some point soon. So thank you. I hope so. I wanna thank, before we get off, Anne, uh, has just been so stalwart in uh, getting us on here and, uh, you know, making this available. I really want to uh, thank Stand.Earth and all of the staff that uh, are fantastic people. I was just with them last week um, that have like thrown themselves into making sure that this is available to activists. This is a very sp special and particular outlet. And I love that uh, you all have committed to, and of course that would not be possible without my friend and colleague. And, uh, you know, sometimes a guy, guy that would have some fisticuffs with it, Todd, who's just a, a brilliant mind and uh, Stand is a fantastic organization. I highly recommend y'all check stand.earth out. And thank you all for being here. Thank you, each of you, for the questions that you have put in, the ones that I could answer, the ones I haven't answered yet. I'll do my best. I hope you will come back and uh, I hope to see you real soon. Thanks, Angel. Thank you.